All right, good morning, everybody. We're picking up in Luke chapter 12. Luke's a very interesting book. <clears throat> interesting because Luke is the doctor uh, who is actually presenting the uh, testimony of Paul. Luke has gone back. He has um, investigated everything that happened during the years that are covered in the book of Luke. And most of the investigation is from the viewpoint of the Pharisee, whose name was Paul. And most of Luke is Paul's testimony about, in fact, it all is of Paul's testimony, uh, about what happened while, while uh, Paul was serving as, by the name of Saul in the uh, Sanhedrin as a Pharisee uh, in that position. Very powerful with inside the community that is there. As we pick up in chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Under these circumstances, time out, what circumstances? Under what circumstances? We are towards the end of the three and a half years of Jesus' ministry, and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, and the Essenes are trying their best. They're all, these are all uh, uh, four groups that have places in the Sanhedrin or seats in the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin literally and truly uh, judges are the judges of what's going on in the life. Now, they've got the king, they've got Herod the king, uh, and they've got, uh, you know, uh, Pontius Pilate who is over the... Um, the Roman part of the Roman business of the area, but truly with inside of the, the nation of Israel, the Sanhedrin controls the, in, every, the everyday life that is going on there, at least in the southern part of Judea and then way up in Galilee. Now, there's an area in between called Samaria, and Samaria is um, uh, a place where after the northern kingdom had fallen, the northern king had moved in uh, people from the Sumer area, Sumer. And you've all heard of the Sumeritan text and the cuneiform and all that happened. He moved Sumer people into that area and they intermarried with the Jews. They became half Jew, half Sumerian, and they built a city called the the name has ended up being changed in English to Samaria as their capital city. And lo and behold, um, we call them that area Samaria now, at least during the time of Jesus' life and ministry here on earth. That area is a forbidden area for the Jews. And even Jesus, uh, not wanting to break tradition too often with what was going on, they would actually, going from Jerusalem straight up to the Sea of Galilee is not very far. It's really about from here to downtown Houston. But because they did not want to go through that huge area called Samaria, they would literally go around and over the Jordan River, up through the Decapolis or the area over there that's a Gentile area now, or then when I say now, now in the time of the life, go through the ten major cities and then go up to Galilee. Or they'd go over towards Joppa to the seaside and ride a boat up a little bit and then get back off and come around it. They literally traveled around this Samaritan area. Well... The split also caused a split in who was in charge of those areas. Herod Antipas is in charge down in Judea, and uh, Herod Philippi is is um, Philip is in charge up in north. Both are descendants of Herod the Great. They were actually Edomites, although and they're not Jews. They are Edomites. They're descendants of Esau. But even though they were called the king of the Jews, or Herod was called the king of the Jew, he was an Edomite. But he had sworn allegiance to the faith of the Jews so he could be their king. And he wasn't a very good king, and his sons did the exact same thing. When it says under these circumstances, the circumstances are these. It is near the end of Jesus' ministry, and the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Herodians and the Essenes have had it with Jesus. Absolutely have had it. They, We've just come out of chapter 11 where they are doing their best to catch Jesus in some sort of sin according to their laws and their traditions. So it says under these circumstances... After so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were stepping on one another, he, speaking about Jesus, began saying to his disciples, First of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, 
If we were to trace right back to chapter 11, we will see these Pharisees and these religious leaders are trying to trip Jesus up and are trying to say, Jesus, our law says this. And Jesus would quote right out of their law back to them, and it always put them in a very uncomfortable situation. And so Jesus is now saying, be careful of the leaven of the Pharisees. Now in the entire Bible, New Testament and Old Testament, New Testament and Old Testament, the, the word leaven is used 13 times. And in every case, be it all, all the way back in Leviticus, in the Levitical law, in the Exodus when it's mentioned, in Exodus or we go on even into the New Testament, it always holds the meaning of corruption. And um, not only corruption, but also perversity. Now, leaven is very interesting. One of my favorite things that I always remember is whenever I was a kid, I grew up, and most of y'all did too, before you could buy sliced bread. Bread would come in a loaf in a plastic package, but it wasn't sliced. And then they begin slicing it, and my mother would always buy the unsliced loaf because they charged a little bit more for the sliced bread. How many of y'all remember that? Yeah, yeah, you do. Okay, showing your age, aren't you? And mine too. Just about the time that sliced bread came out, and my mother was willing to buy it, uh, about the time she had bought her last loaf totally, um, I think she actually switched to sliced bread because she figured out that if we had sliced bread, I wouldn't eat so much of the loaf. Because it was so much fun, she'd bring home two loaves of bread, and I kind of thought one of them was for mine, for me. And I would take that loaf of bread, and it always amazed me after I figured, I mean, just a young kid. I would take that loaf of bread about that big and begin squashing it. And I'd squash it down, and it ended up being just a little bit bigger than a golf ball size of dough. And I was always amazed it had that big old little loaf, always went down to this golf ball size of, of flour, cooked flour. I didn't understand what was going on, but later on as I came to know the Lord and came to read the scriptures, I understood and I ran across this word leaven. Leaven causes things to puff up. And that's what happens when you take this leaven and you put it into the flour and the mix and you let it rise, it puffs up. It looks bigger, it looks more powerful than it really is. And there's really not much there in a loaf of bread even still today. And so I was amazed at that. Well, my next door neighbor, Miss Mary Smith, she had in her refrigerator this jar. It was a mason jar but even back in the 60s, I had never seen a mason jar this thick in the way it looked. It was an old mason jar from 1881. And inside this jar was this concoction of stuff. And she made the best biscuits and the best bread. You know what I'm talking about. It was starter. It's starter. And it was her grandmother's, great-grandmother's starter <clears throat> that it started and had passed down through the girls. And she would mix all this stuff up, and I would stand right in the corner of her little kitchen, and I would watch her as she uh, created this dough and rolled it out. I couldn't do it today if I had to for you. And she would roll it out, but she would, in mixing it up, she'd take that out, and she would dip out just a little starter, and she would put it in the mix, and then she would add other stuff back to the jar of stuff. She would, what she called, she would feed it and back in. And she cooked bread every single day. And I remember, how old is that stuff? Well, that stuff's been around since 1891. And I went. <laughs> now, when you're standing there and you're holding a piece of bread in your hand, that's still hot, that just came out of the oven a roll, and she tells you that that stuff's been around since 1881, and your mother has always told you all your life not to eat anything that was old. <laughs> I had a choice to make. Was my mother telling me the truth, or was she telling me a lie, because this roll is really good? 
and I've had way too many of them to be sick. Well, the interesting thing is, what happens is, talking about leaven, it puffs up. Leaven, a little bit of leaven, a little bit fact of leavened dough could be put into the rest of a mixture and cause that process to start. It's a chemical process. It's a fermenting process of where the sugars begin to be released. But the real true fact is it's a putrefaction process. I left that word in there. In fact, my editor said, you sure you want to use the word putrefaction? Yes, it is a rotting process. It is a breaking down process that begins to take place. It's that interesting thing about our life uh, and what is causing all this to happen is oxygen. The same thing that we have to have to live this life is the bad boy in the world that causes things to rust and to rot and all of that in this process. Well, when he's talking about this leaven causing this putrefaction to start up when oxygen hits it, uh, that's part of this really bad process because it begins to puff up. And he has said, Jesus has said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Don't let that get out of your mind because this entire lesson and some of next week's lesson is talking about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Hypocrisy, hypocrisy in many different forms, and it's all can be summed up in hypocrisy of these Pharisees. In fact, over in 1 Corinthians, which is really the second letter to the Corinthians, the church there in Corinth has got more bad, corrupt, putrefied issues than any other church out there and Paul is going to write two letters to them he's actually written three there's a letter before this letter that is written to the church and this is only a part of it so there in first Corinthians he's writing to this church that has got lots of problems he's telling them to get these problems taken care of he says your boasting is not good do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. You're unleavened, but you're allowing leaven to come in. You're allowing sin to come in. You're allowing corruption and putrefaction to come into your lives, even though because you belong to the Lord, you belong to God, you belong to Jehovah, you belong to Yahweh, you belong to Him, but yet you allow the world to... Uh, to come in and affect the way you are living and it's really truly hypocrisy on your part because you are copying what the same problem these Pharisees had back when Jesus was alive. Paul's going on said, For Christ our Passover also has been sanctified. Therefore let us celebrate the feast of Passover not with old leaven nor with the leaven of malice and with wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. There's been a previous letter. Do you see it there? We don't have that letter. It was not considered scripture. But there was a problem within the church at Corinth. They were associating with immoral people. Now he goes on. Let's see what kind of immoral people he's talking about. I did not at all mean with immoral people of this world or with the covetous and the swindlers or with the idolaters, for then you would have had to go out of this world. I'm not talking about the people who are outside the church. I'm talking about the people who are inside the church. If I was to tell you do not associate with the immoral people of this world, you would have to die and leave this world. I'm not talking about, he says, because this world is full of swindlers. This world is full of immoral people. This world is full of crooks. Crooks, crooks, crooks. Thieves, thieves, thieves. And by the way, you're all related to them. We're all related to each other. And yet, if you go back to the story of Abraham and his sons it doesn't take long before the sons are fighting against the sons and the grandsons against the grandsons and they're all trying to take over and Abraham's got problems with his nephew and the whole nine yards is going on here where the people who are relatives who ought to love one another don't know how to love one another because of that corruption that is inside their lives. He says, I, you would have to go out of this world not to deal with that. You can't go down to Kroger's and go buy food and not deal with immoral people. That's just impossible. 
But he's saying this, but actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is in an immoral is an immoral person or covetous or idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. In other words, he's talking about the people within the people who say, I'm a believer. You can't be a believer and knowingly be a swindler, a reviler, a corrupt person. If you knowingly are doing that, you are knowingly out of God's will. He says within the church, do not associate that. Go on, watch on. Verse 12 says, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? I can't judge the outside world. It's not my place to judge the outside world. Even as your minister, it is not my place to judge the people who live over on Sage River and never, ever enter the door of a church or any type of religious facility whatsoever. It's not my place to judge them. They are already judged by the world. In fact, he says, do you not do you not judge those who are within the church but those who are outside God judges remove the wicked man from among yourselves we are not to judge the people who do who are not part of the faith what's faith there are different types of faith there's faith in Christ there's faith in Allah there's faith in Buddha there's faith in um, uh, Judaism the five major religions of the world. Those are all the faiths. And in every one of those faiths, there's a trust and a belief system that gets you to allow yourself to be part of that faith system. Some of those systems are knit together. Judaism and Christianity are knit together. Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, those are not knit together. Actually, they are. Buddhism and Hinduism are knit together. Islam is a radical religion that has been formed out of a changing of the words and the laws from Judaism and Christianity. We take a Koran, we read the Koran, we can go directly to the Old Testament or to the New Testament and find those teachings, but those teachings have been changed. And supposedly, the great Allah told Muhammad who could not read and could not write. Remember that. He could not read and he could not write. Told him the true story and he told the story and it was written down by one of his wives. He had 12 wives and uh, lots of children. He says, we can't judge those who are outside of us, but we are to judge those who are right here with us. This is the worst thing for me to have with a thing on it called Facebook. Because every time I pull up Facebook and I'm scrolling through my thousands of friends and I see something, I lay down the phone and I say, okay, Lord, what am I supposed to do with that now? What they have just said on Facebook. Because I'm their minister. Now, I'm supposed to judge them because they say that they're part of the faith. And yet they have just said something on Facebook that is way out of line of the faith. But I've also got other people in there that I expect them to be putting things that are way out of of line on the faith because they're my friends, but they're not part of the church. They're not part of the faith. I am not going to judge them. I do not judge anyone on anything they do outside. The courts are going to do that when they do something wrong, and God will judge them on that, as the Scripture says, as Paul says. But what he goes on to say here, talking about this leaven of the Pharisees, let's get back to the scripture. Verse 2 says, But there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed, and hidden that will not be known. Nothing covered up. Nothing out there. In fact, we can go on and read. And before I speak about it, verse 3 says, Accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and whatever you have whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed upon the housetops. I say to you, my friend, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more uh, uh, that they can do to you. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the ones, capitalized, who after he has killed, has the authority to cast you into hell or to the lake of fire at Hades. I tell you, fear him. Let's pick this up. I want you to understand. Everything that you do, you could be like the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. You say one thing, but inside your heart there's something else going on. You say one thing. 
In fact, uh, Jesus is going to uh, say uh, to the Pharisees in another conversation that's about to come up, he's going to say, you Pharisees, you teach not to commit adultery, yet you commit adultery with so-and-so and so-and-so. You teach not to kill, but yet you kill. You teach not to steal, but here you're stealing. And there's five things he brings up, Jesus brings up, that is flat in the face of these Pharisees, and they can't say a word back to him because every word they have said, he has said, is true. And I will tell you, it is a truth. I don't care who you are in this room, who you are. One day when you die, somebody has to deal with the stuff you've left behind. And somebody will know the way you really were in your hearts. That somebody will know. When they go and they pick up your stuff, I will tell you this. I have been part of situations where because I am an executor on the will of someone, I will go in to clean up their apartment or their house with a bunch of y'all who will go help me to do that, to get ready for an estate sale or whatever. And lo and behold, as I go through, I always go through now my first, the first time by myself before I invite anybody else to come over because I cannot tell you how many people I have been disappointed in. They stand at our doors, they shake people's hands, they hand out bulletins, they say they belong to the Lord, and yet the crud and the perverseness that I find in their drawers next to their bed stands, in their bathrooms and everything tell a different story. They are hypocrites. They shake your hands and you think, hey, they're good. They love the Lord with all their hearts, with all their soul, with all their might. Thank you for Old Testament passages. Yes, and then they die. Whatever you have that is perverse in your life, you need to get rid of it today because I promise you, the day you die, it will scream from the housetop as people will come in to take care of your stuff. And everybody's stuff has to be taken care of. But let's just go even further than that. Everything that you have done has been recorded in the books of remembrance, according to the Old Testament. The books of remembrance have everything written down. You can't run from the things that you've done. You can't live one life and yet in your heart have a different life. You can't on the outside be portraying yourself as goody, 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 but on the inside you're nasty, nasty, nasty. Oh, some of you are pretty good faking at it, but I got news for you. It only takes one allegation and 20 years or 40 years of what you've done and tried to show that you lived for one bad allegation to you, whether it is true or whether it is false, can destroy 40 years of the way you've lived your life in a heartbeat. We're in political t season today. Political seasons. Listen to it. If you happen to listen to Fox News or something like that, there are two candidates out there right now that said one or two words. One of them said one word and the other said two words that have caused their campaigns to literally go south. Everything they've done, everybody's overlooked, they've been okay with everything, but now they've said either one word or two words when asked a question by a moderator and their campaigns have gone south. Their political career is virtually over and hopefully tomorrow it will be over because now we know. By the way, if you live down in Clear Lake, you have two choices. I mean, no, let me take that back. Down in Clear Lake, if you go to, this, to, to uh, vote tomorrow, you can make your vote as short as two votes. Huh? Tuesday. Tuesday, I'm sorry. You can make your vote as short as two checks if you live in Clear Lake because there's only two things. Do That's a constitutional amendment. Yeah. yeah. No, two choices. Just let you know. I don't care how you vote. Go vote. Actually, I do care how you vote. <laughs> and I hope it starts with an R on the first one this go around. <laughs> next, next go around may be different. I understand it. Next go around may be different. But on this one, this one, we've got to have a change. People are coming to my office because their doctors are telling them that their doctor, their doctors are telling them that they can no longer treat them because 
it is against the law now not to have insurance and the doctors are being penalized for treating anyone because it is against the law. You cannot, doctors are not supposed to be providing services for someone who is breaking the law by not having insurance. Got that? So doctors are turning them down. They can no longer be cash payments. The little, the folks who are not accepting insurance, the doctors have opened up these little uh, urgent care sites, but they can't accept insurance if they, if they, they can't take you by for pay by cash because if they accept insurance. So if they accept insurance, they can't take you for cash. If they don't take insurance, they can still break the law by treating you for cash. And these outside units, these little doctor's offices, as fast as they've come up, are now beginning to shut their doors because of these issues. Okay, we've got to have some changes. We've got to have some changes. Also, there's caps on what insurance will pay on certain things. To where it comes to a certain time in your, uh, what we're finding, a certain time in your treatment, and the caseworker is coming to you and saying, okay, we've come to the end of what your insurance is paying so now we need to do something different okay over and over and over this is rolling out since january in my office as people are coming to me and saying can the church help pay for this 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 that's what we're facing it's so listen everything back to where we should have been everything that is out there every desire of your heart everything that is actually out, out there that is being whispered in the rooms will be proclaimed from the housetop of what your true heart is on the matter i promise you that verse 20 verse 6 says are not five sparrows sold for two cents yet not one of them is forgotten before god indeed the very hairs on your head are numbered do not fear you are more valuable than many sparrows. This is an important part about our value. I actually, as a kid, used to wonder, as I sat on the third row at First Church, Waxahachie, right behind the two rows of deacons who smelt like cigarettes, and I was right there. I'm just playing. Okay, but they did, all right? And I always, when the preacher would read this, I would think, I am, you know, I know that they're going to get there where that they're going to create that microscope that is able to look down on every one of my hairs and see the number on it. That's how I thought. That's how a kid thinks. But more than that is, I was so glad that I'm worth more than two cents. You buy a sparrow, I'm worth more than that. The value of that is worth more than that. More, more, more. I'm not worried about those who can say, Johnny, you shouldn't do that. Jimmy, you shouldn't do that. Chrissy, you shouldn't do that. Pam, you shouldn't do that. What I'm worried about is the record book that tells everyone there in eternity what I have done and if I have not entered into a relationship with the deliverer the Messiah the Savior then I am worried about the one who can say I send you on to the lake of fire I send you on to Hades I send you on to that place I'm of more value. Verse 8 says, And I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess him also before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will, deny, will be denied before the angels of God. Summing up what I already know from the rest of Scripture, we disown Jesus, the Savior, the Deliverer, Jesus is the name actually from the Old Testament, Joshua, meaning the, the deliverer. When we think we, uh, when we hope no one will think that we are Christians, we disown him, we, that we love Christ. When we decide not to speak for what is right, when we are silent about our relationships with God, when we blend into society, when we accept our culture's non-Christian values, that's when we disown Jesus. We acknowledge Jesus when we live moral, upright, Christ-honoring lives. When we look for opportunities to share our faith with others. When we help others in need. When we take a stand for justice. When we love others. When we proclaim our loyalty to Christ. When we use our lives and resources to carry out His desires rather than our own. I want to scream about things that have happened uh, this week. 
This week, the CEO of Starbucks has said, if you believe in the belief of biblical marriage and you own Starbucks shares, I want you to share, uh, sell those shares immediately because that is not the belief of our, of our con uh, company. This week, Home Depot has allowed for sensitivity training in Islamic beliefs. Last Friday, as I went to the Methodist hospital to notarize papers for a woman who is having a double lung bypass at 1 o'clock, and we're notarizing the papers at 11, as I walk into the Methodist hospital, Methodist hospital, you got that, Methodist? I hardly ever go through the main entryway, but I went that way because I had two people with me that I would having to lead through. We went through the front area. I usually go and park in a different place that's a little harder to park, but easier to get to for me and walk in a back door that the doctors and the nurses come in and I usually go to straight to the elevators and go up. I don't go through the Dunn, uh, met the Dunn uh, lobby area of all the people. And as I walk through and go past the Dunn Towers, I make a turn and there is the Islamic Prayer Center right prevalent there. I am ready for us to form an organization to train Americans in Christian sensitivity training. Because we are not, they are not being sensitive to the same thing of us. Every Muslim out there wants you to be sensitive to his beliefs, to provide a place for him to go and pray five times a day and we know that that's not exactly what's occurring in the prayer times. Even in our jails, do you know, in our jail systems in the state of Texas, Muslims can go five times a day to a place and pray together where the guards cannot go. In a room where guards cannot go in Texas because they've sued and they've won that privilege. You got to be sensitive to them. Folks, it's time for us to form something to where we can require uh, all the uh, corporations and everything also to take sensitivity training to Christ, to Christianity about what we believe and what our faith is so that they will know what our faith is because they don't know. And most of them have the name Christians hanging on them and they are nothing more than hypocrites. You heard it here. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Sharia law is coming to America. Uh, part of Britain is already now under Sharia law, not under British law, and so is part of France. It's coming. Yes, ma'am. <sighs> Listen to this. <clears throat> and everyone, verse 10 says, and everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man it will be forgiven him. Did you catch that? Who's the son of man? Old Testament tells us who it is. Okay, it's, it's the Messiah. It's the deliverance the Savior. It's Jesus. You can say what you want about Jesus. And I love this about Jesus. His shoulders are big enough to say whatever you want to say to him. And it won't bother him a bit. It won't bother him. You can say, you can, you can say, Jesus... Right now, I hate you for what you allowed to happen, such and such and such and such. And that's okay. Because you're supposed to have a relationship with him. And relationships mean being able to say, I'm not happy with what's going on right now. 
It happens in marriages. It happens in families. We say, I'm not happy what's going on. And then we say, Lord, I am very happy with what's going on. But also we say, Lord, what is your will on this thing? That's okay. You can say anything. In fact, if you want to read more about that, go over to first and second chapter of Hebrews, written to the Hebrews, the Jews, and see what is said there about this very topic. But look what on. It says, but he who blasphemy, blasphemes, that means to do an unforgivable act, to, to continue to be obstinate and to reject the message of the Savior who comes. It says, but the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit it will not be forgiven. What's one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit laid out in the Old Testament and in the New Testament? Both. They're in the Old and they're in the New. There's nothing new in the New Testament. You've heard me say that many, many times. You think you've got something that's in the New Testament? Uh-uh. It's not new. Everything, including the Revelation, these letters in the First and Second Corinthians, Thessalonians and Romans and Acts, all that stuff that happens in all those books, including Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, we can go all the way back to the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, and we can find from the Lord those first thoughts that are going to be laid out for man, one card upon another, one bit of information upon another, so that the full progress through the full progression of time, all of what God expects is laid out for us and it's going to move and it's going to go through all those 2700 years of stories in the book of Genesis which tells us what's right and what's wrong even before Moses comes along even when we get to the book of Moses and we get to the laws go spend some time in the Pentateuch and look at Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy but at the same time open your detailed outline if you will make one of the book of Genesis and every single thing you see in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy you can see the beginning of that thought in the book of Genesis and you can see a reason for that thought in those books over in the book of Genesis because the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings that tells us how God what God likes and what he approves of and what he disapproves of and by the time Moses comes along he just lays it out for you boom 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 and even at that, we keep on going. And then we get to Isaiah, who deals with all of that and says, but all of this is being curled up, re leading to the Savior and Deliverer. And everyone in these Pharisees and Sadducees who are there in front of Jesus right now know, and they're looking for the Savior, they're looking for the Deliverer, but they don't want it to be Jesus at this point in time. Why? Because by this time, they've started leaving out parts of the Old Testament that they don't want you to read. They've got this Old Testament thing all kind of sewed up to where they've pulled certain passages that they're going to use in the every week worship, but they don't know the rest of the story that's in the Old Testament. So he goes on, he says, When they bring you before the synagogues, and the rulers and the authorities do not worry, about what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that hour what you ought to say. He'll teach you. Even though you think you don't know what you... Don't worry. Don't worry. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will say, don't say anything. Just be there. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will say, when they ask you a question, you say to them, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. Sometimes when they ask you a question, the Holy Spirit will quicken your mind, as he did in the Old Testament with David and Solomon and many of the others, and the answer will come. But the answer that comes is always an answer that's already been given. Already been given. Sometimes if you ever go to the hospital, you don't know what to say. That's okay. Just go. Just show up. If you're only there for five minutes, say I've been praying for you. When you think about somebody that you hadn't heard of in a while, pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I was just thinking about you. I really don't have anything to say, but I was just worried to see how things are going. I just want to let you know I'm thinking about you. Do you know what that does to a person? It ministers to them. It does. When you need it, the Holy Spirit will tell you. And if someone comes to your mind, it's probably because the Holy Spirit's saying, you need to call this person. Don't just think about them and don't call. When you think, and you think about them, call. I'll tell you how bad it is. Not bad, it's good. 
I'll walk through my offices and I'll say to my secretaries, well, it's been about five months since we heard from so-and-so, and I'll go sit down. Phone will ring. The girls will go, hey, Jim, guess who it is? Who is it? Well, you just mentioned their name. I don't know how I know. It's just about time. It's about time for him, for him to prepare me to get me ready for what I'm fixing to deal with on the phone. It's how the Lord moves in our lives. Someone then in the crowd said to him, now we're talking about hypocrisy here still. That's the topic that we really are in. The hypocrisy, the leaven of the Pharisees. But someone in the crowd says to Jesus, Teacher, will you please tell me, he doesn't say the word please, but we put it in. Will you tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me? <laughs> now this is a job of the rabbis. This is not a job of the Sanhedrin. This is not a job of the Pharisees. What if this was a job of the rabbis? You would go to the rabbis about the inheritance, and lo and behold, they're the ones who would say, Yeah, you deserve it. No, you don't deserve it, and all that type of stuff. Well, Jesus responds, but he doesn't respond directly to that question. He's going to use that question of divide the inheritance equally or whatever to bring up another topic, and it happens to be a topic that's closely tied to hypocrisy, and it's the topic of greed. He says, but I said to him, man, who appointed me judge or arbitrator over you? Then he said to them, be aware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. He's taking this to transcend way above and over just the thought of this earthly life. He's springing off of this inheritance deal to spring into eternal life. You see, and well, let's deal with the this deal of greed that happens inside this. I, I cannot tell you. We'll, a car will come in and we'll give a car away and then somebody who's heard that I gave a car away will call the office and this is what they say. This is not what I hear. This is what they say. Where's my car? Or I help someone with their rent and they have told somebody and the person calls me and says I hear you help them with their rent can you do mine too and I said well I don't know do you need help with your rent well if you're giving out free money I'm going to take it <laughs> okay or you've got the person like this who and you all know people like this are just negative in their greed they cannot find joy in somebody receiving something good Travis Terrell was here this morning. He was sitting right here. Travis took over a snap-on tool uh, distribution uh, route. They handed him 256 accounts, of which only five of them were actually decent accounts. The rest of them was just on, were on his route, and he had to go build relationships and see if he could they'll sell stuff to him and all that. Lo and behold, at the end of his first year, Travis Terrell did so well, he won a Mini Cooper car. I was so thrilled and I, that's just the way I am. I am thrilled beyond joy when the Lord blesses you with something. Just thrilled beyond joy. Although, amongst his other buddies who drive snap-on tool trucks in the Houston area, Travis wished he had never gotten the thing. Because it's like, oh, what'd you do different than me? Well, how come they didn't give it to me? Well, it's all it's me, 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 me. Well, where's mine? Joy! You go to your mailbox and something comes from some company saying, here's our gift to you. And your next door neighbor says to you, well, where's mine? Where's mine? What does it matter? No joy. Greed. Greed beyond greed beyond all forms of greed are out there. And it's all hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. He says to you, I'm not the ones who should be judging. Be aware of those who all, have all these forms of greed. Let's get on past that. Verse, uh, uh, oops, need to turn the page around. To verse 16, he says, and he told them a parable. Here's a parable. 
Here's how he's pushing it into eternity. He says the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? It's been a good year. Then he says, I'll tell you what. This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. By the way, that's a quote right out of the book of Ecclesiastes, which repeats in Ecclesiastes several times. Verse 20 says, But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? Your inheritance. Who will own it? What you've prepared. Is it going to go to the grateful urchins or to the greedy urchins? Urchins, you know, children. <laughs> or no children goes to your relatives. Where's it going to go? You've built all this up for yourself, all in greed because you love what you've built up, but you've not built for yourselves in heaven the things that need to be ready for you. This is the man who stores up treasure for himself, and he is not rich towards God. And he said to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life, as to what you will eat, nor for your body, as to what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. And I love this passage, because we're back. One of the things that happens in all the scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, Genesis as well as the book of Revelation, a thought will be begun by the Lord, he will hit several things and give you information. Then he circles back to that same thought. And then he circles again, giving more information. He circles and always, and they keep coming back to these same thoughts. So here we're back at the thought of the value of your life. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom or barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than birds? Remember the other time it was just two cents. Now he's explaining it. For which of you by worrying can add a single hour to his lifespan. If then you cannot do even a little thing, a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. But I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass in the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow it th thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, you men of little faith? And do you not seek what you will eat and what you will drink? Oh, I'm sorry, and do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink. And do not keep worrying. For all these things the nation of the nations of the world eagerly seeks. But your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom, and these things will be added to you. It's not about getting your inheritance here. It's about getting your inheritance there. It's not what you prepare for or worry about here. It's what you prepare for and worry about there. Verse 32, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Have you built things and set things aside in your life for the kingdom? Don't worry about it. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves money belts which do not wear out. Money belts that do not wear out. You can't take money with you. He's not talking about real money. He's talking about treasures in heaven and unfailing treasures in heaven that where no thief comes near nor moths destroy. Kay and I got married back in 1979. Our colors were rust and mauve. We were given boxes and boxes, 18 by 18 by 18 inch boxes of we stored up all of our rust and mauve pillows and cases and, and um, sheets and bedspreads and towels and uh, wash rags and the placeholders for the tables, and you name it, it was all in rust and mauve. And we bought our first house over on Swanley Court um, in 1987, and we painted it all the beautiful colors of pink and blue. And then we pulled out all of our 
box stuff that had been boxed all of our married life. And as Kay pulls it out, she goes, oh, this won't fit. Oh, this won't fit. Oh, this won't fit. And I walked in, and she's in tears. And I said, Kay, what's wrong, darling? She looks at me, and she's holding up these rust towels against the pink wall. And she says, lay up not for yourselves treasures here on earth, which rust and moth <laughs> may destroy. Uh, isn't it interesting how God has a sense of humor in our lives and things come to mind? So he said, not these things, do things that they can't steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is. Is your treasure on getting what your brother owes you in your inheritance today? Or is your treasure in the value of your life and what God's value is for you? And that you have laid up for yourselves things that cannot be stolen, cannot be taken away. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamp lit. Be like men who are waiting for their masters when they return from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes in and knocks. You're there, you're waiting for the master who's gone off with his bride and is going to come back. And when he comes out, you're ready to open the door for them. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that I will gird himself to... Um, that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table. The word at the table is not there. That's implied. They didn't have tables back there. They laid on the floor and on mats, but that's implied for our day to understand. And will come up and wait on them. Gr great is your reward if you're ready to help the Lord when he comes. In other words, whether he comes in the second watch or even the third watch or finds them so blessed are those slaves. 39 says, but be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known what hour the thief was coming, he would have allowed his house to be broken into. He would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You ever been robbed? You ever been robbed? If you knew you were going to be robbed, you'd have done something about it. I had to face this about a year ago when robberies were happening in Bay Oaks and the, the bandits were so smart. They would go in and they would only bust in the bottom window on a low window where they could reach up and open the latch and pull it up. They could get the stuff out of the glass out of the way and they could go in. And if the lock on the door did not have a turn thing but a key and the key wasn't in it, they wouldn't take very much. They would go to the bedroom, they'd get the jewelry, and they'd pull the mattress off the beds and get the guns that are under the beds, which is probably where yours are too. And they would take still guns, then they would steal the jewelry. And they'd go out right out that outside hole. The alarm has not gone off because most of them don't have glass breakage alarm system. So no one knew until they got home that they'd been robbed. Now, wait a minute. If you go in and you have one of those turn things on your door, the back door is going to be open. That's fine. But they've come in through the glass. They're going to spend some time in there. They're going to get everything. They're going to go through every closet because they know to go to the closet where you have pillows and things stuffed because that's where your jewelry is in little Ziploc bags stuffed and hidden. Don't tell me it's there. I just know it's there. And you've got stuff in your jars, and they're pulling over the jars, and they're breaking all of that. They're grabbing the guns. They're grabbing everything. They're grabbing anything of value, and they're opening the door, the very last thing. The alarm is surely going to go off, but you know how it is. When an alarm goes off, it takes 20 minutes for anybody to even come because the alarm system is going to call 15 numbers before they finally decide to call the police. And there they're gone. And then we looked on our map, of Bay Oaks map, and lo and behold, they're hitting over here. And then while the police are over there, they're hitting over here, and they're hitting three to five houses every Tuesday between 10 and 4. It was always on the same day. It was their M.O. My wife says, you've got to do something before they come to our house. Put bars on our windows. Oh, my. Well, I got creative. I went to the steel place and found these fancy, fancy rosette type big steel things made out of solid steel with leaves and gore. Oh, they're gorgeous. They're just gorgeous. And I bought enough forever, figured out every window size and bought enough and took them home and went down to the metal shop and bought half inch steel square rod, not tube, but rod, welded tabs on it, welded that thing. It's got two bars across it. If you want to come in that bottom window, you can try, but it's got lag bolts going about this far into the windows, and it, they're on the inside. They look gorgeous. They're beautiful, but you, I guarantee you, if a if a, a robber comes to my house, they're going to see that, and they're going, hmm. 
I'll keep him out. Verse 40, be ready. So too be ready. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you do not know or expect. You've got to be ready. You've got to have the bars on your window, not to keep him out, but to keep the thieves out. And just like a thief, you don't know when a thief is coming. You've got to be ready for him even if he comes. And so too when the Savior comes from you. Because you don't know when the time is going to come when he is going to come for you. Verse 41 says, Peter said to him, oh, Peter's always speaking up. Boy, Peter's so impetuous. I'll be glad whenever Peter finally grows up. Lord, you are addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well. And the Lord says, oh. Who then is the faithful and sensible steward, who, whom his master will put in charge of his servants, to give them their nation rations? I'm sorry, at the proper time. Blessed is the slave whom your master finds so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, blessed. Uh, should I say you that will be put? Uh, I'm sorry. Truly, I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. When I leave here, when I'm through, when the master comes, the one who finds his servant doing what he's supposed to be doing, that's the one who's going to be in charge of everything. It's the one that can be trusted. The one that's trusted. But if that slave says in his heart, can't be trusted in other words, my master will be gone a long time and coming and begins to beat the slaves, and both men and women, and to eat and to drink and to get drunk. The master of the slaves will come one day when he does not expect him and at an hour that he does not know and will cut him in pieces and assign him to the place with the unbelievers. Okay, this is not the slave who's faithful. This is a slave who's been put in charge of the house until the he, master comes back. And when the master comes back, this slave has been ruthless on all the other slaves. This person, this caretaker, has eaten and drinking and drunk and wine and all that type of stuff, and he has not taken care of the business of the master. And what will the master do to him? According to this, he will cut him in pieces and relegate him to a different place with the unbelievers. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. But the one who, he, who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of flogging, but will receive but few. From every one who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom, the, and whom they entrust much of him, they will ask all the more. What does all that mean? To the Pharisees and the Sadducees who have been given the very oracles of God. They know what God expects. Jesus, I'm telling you, there's nothing new in the New Testament. Jesus says asking nothing more than what is all through the Old Testament of the oracles of God, the instructions, the statutes, the oracles of God, if they will just take care and do what they have been expected to do so when the Master, their Savior, Deliverer comes, they will be ready and, and waiting. But no, these Pharisees have gone in a different direction. In a different direction. And they are not worthy for the master to accept them. He says, I have come to cast fire upon the earth. And I, how I wish that it was already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo. And how distressed I am until it is accomplished. He's within days of his crucifixion. That's his baptism. And with that happens, we'll come on into a thought process, a belief system that will lead on until his coming when he kindles that fire. That's for another story, another time, but it is coming up in Luke. He says, Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided. Three against two, two against three. They will divide it father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. What's he talking about? He's talking about belief in the faith. I have seen it to where one person of a large family accepts the Lord as their Savior. And not doing anything wrong in doing so, probably one of the other family members will also accept the Lord. But the family will be divided because, oh, they're part of that group now. I know how this is because I know how it is to be part of a family where everybody drinks, everybody does drugs, and when the Hastings show up, they think they have to put all that away. 
Actually, it's the Holy Spirit that's telling them they have to put it away. Because when Kay and I walk in now with my Madison, everything and all the language changes. Oh, but I have made the mistake of coming back towards the garage after we have left because I've forgotten something, only to hear the words that are being said about us from the living room. And the drugs and the alcohol are back out. It divides families. It divides families. And so it does. Scripture's correct. Verse 54. We're headed towards the end of this chapter. It says, And he was always saying to the crowd, When you see a cloud rising in the west, and you see that cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, A shower is coming. And so it turns out. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, It will be a hot day. And it turns out that way. You hypocrites. So here we're back on the... Here we go. We circled back around. You hypocrites. Been given the oracles of God. You're greedy. You've been put in charge of everything. And yet when the master's coming, you're not ready for him. And you need to be punished because of the way you've treated the people. You know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and the skies. But why do you not analyze the present time? And why do you not even on your own initiative judge what is right? What you know from your own laws, what is right, and yet you judge them wrong because you've made up your 631 laws that are loosely associated with thoughts in the Old Testament but are not direct to what the law of Moses was. For while you were going with your opponent to appear before the magistrate, on your way there, make an effort to settle with him so that he may not drag you before the judge, and the judge turn you over to the officer, and the officer throw you into the prison. And here's the problem. I can't tell you about what that actually means because it's a bad chapter break that takes us into chapter 13, but I will tell you really quickly. On your way to the main magistrate, to the big magistrate, to God the Father, who has the authority to put you before the judge, and that has been placed in the hands of the Lord Jesus, who has been given the power to turn you over to the officials to send you to the lake of fire. Before all of that happens, settle up and make an arrangement in your relationship with the Lord that you need to before you get there. Lord Jesus, we thank you. For this message that you've given us as our Lord and Savior. And Father, we thank you for sending him to be our Savior in your name.